Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Um, this is a textile talk brought to you by Studio Art Quilt Associates. We are one of the six organizations who put on textile talks. We rotate. So every week, a different organization is bringing you the presentation. And today, we're going to be sharing the work of three of the artists who are in our brand new exhibition, Primal Forces Earth. You are the first people to see the works from this exhibition. It won't premiere in real life um, until September at the National Quilt Museum. So this is a real sneak preview. And we're very fortunate that we're going to be able to hear from Paula Rafferty, Kit Vincent, and Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry. Before we get started, um, I want to just point out that if you are seeing um, closed captioning, you can toggle that off by clicking on the closed captioning button on a computer, it's along the bottom, and that should turn it off if it's in your way. But we're hoping that this new function that Zoom offers will help people who, for whom English is not their first language or for whom um, their hearing is not what it used to be, to be able to follow, follow along as our artists make their presentations. As you watch the presentations, if you have questions, please feel free to type them into either the chat or the q and I'll be watching and we'll be gathering all your questions together to present to the artists. Before we get started, I want to just tell you a little bit about Studio Art Quilt Associates, otherwise known by our acronym SAQA SAQA. We are a membership organization. We have about 4,000 members um, in about 39 countries around the world. Our focus is to promote the art quilt as a fine art medium. And it, to that end, we offer conferences, we do publications, we do exhibitions like Primal Forces Earth. So what I wanted to also bring to your attention before we get started is our magazine, Art Quilt Quarterly. And Lucy, am I out of order? And maybe I should mention our sponsors first. Let back up. Before I tell you about the magazine, I do want to tell you about our sponsors. And that's because doing textile talks costs the six organizations collectively almost $40,000 between the cost of the Zoom platform and the mailing program and having our presenters and having the staff time. And so we would not be able to continue to do this without the underwriting that our sponsors have generously provided. So I would really like to thank our platinum level sponsors, Moda Fabrics and Quilting Daily, our silver level sponsors, eQuilter and Aurifil Threads, and our bronze level sponsors, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Exotic Silks or Thai Silks, and thequiltshow.com. Without their support, none of this would be possible. All right, now I'm gonna tell you about Art Quilt Quarterly Magazine. I don't know if you can see me in the little tiny window, but here's another copy of it that was the previous issue. Art Quilt Quarterly comes out four times a year and is full of um, over a hundred art quilts in each issue, along with artist interviews, museum collections, and other things that people who love art quilts really enjoy reading about. Um, if you are watching this textile talk, you can get $5 off by using the discount code TALKS when you subscribe to Art Quilt Quarterly Magazine. It's a beautiful magazine. You won't regret trying it. All right, now I would like to um, first introduce you to Paula Rafferty, whose piece is on the right there. And 
she's going to tell you a little bit about her work and her studio practice and how she came to make the piece that is part of Primal Forces Earth. Paula, turn on your camera and your microphone and take it away. Thank you, Martha. Next slide, please, Lucy. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you about my quilt for the Sakwa Primal Forces Earth exhibit, which is called Tights Come Down. This is my first juried Sakwa show, and I'm very excited to be showing my work alongside all these amazing textile artists. Next slide, please. I'm from Ireland. It's an island situated on the western edge of Europe, as you can see in the right hand image. And on the left, there's a picture of Ireland and circled in red is Dundalk, the place where I grew up. It's situated on the coast and it's just the most beautiful place filled with ancient ruins. And I used to climb two of these old castles as a kid. Circled in black down below is Limerick, where I came to study fashion design in 1987, and I'm still here. Next slide, please. I'm happiest when I'm out in nature, and during the last year and a half, being able to escape to the River Shannon has saved my sanity, as well as providing me with inspiration for my current work. These pictures so show a side of me that most people never see, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, wouldn't want to see it either. I've swum since I was a child, but always in swimming pools. But COVID forced me out into the river, which was both terrifying and exhilarating at the same time, as I've a childhood fear of water. These pictures were taken earlier on in the year during the winter time, two during different full moons, that's the moon, not the sun. And in the third photo, uh, yeah, a not so flattering photo of me, but there you go. It was snowing in that photo, but uh, the snowflakes are so small that you can barely see them. We get very excited over here if we see a little bit of snow. Next slide, please. This next slide shows my inspiration for my piece. On the left, you can see a picture of Doolan Caves in County Clare, which contains the largest stalactite in Europe and it's called the Great Stalactite. It stands at approximately 7.3 meters high. That's about 23 foot. And it took thousands, tens of thousands of years to form. It's still growing. And that's all from one drop of water, which I think is just mind blowing. The next slide shows a view of the inside of the ancient lift that you descend down into to get to the bottom. This is a view on the left from the bottom of the lift. And I've also just included some more pictures of the stalactite. I just think it's beautiful. Next slide, please. This is my finished piece. And I tried to express my awe of this natural growing flowing form to me there's an otherworldly delicacy to it and a, just an imposing beauty the image you see was created in a computer program called photoshop where i took my original photograph and played a really quilted it. So I suppose you could call it a whole cloth quilt. I've been playing with this technique for about a year and a half now, and I've created about 15 pieces ranging in size from about 20 to 40 centimeters to over 40 inches. This next slide shows some other pieces using this technique. I'm able to show them to you because this project, uh, these were seen as advertising on the quiltshow.com for the EQA, the European Quilt Association Picture Exchange Challenge. We had to pick a photograph. It got digitally cut in half. 
I made one half of it and then a partner in another country in Europe made the other half and they're going to be shown later on online in the year about 800 little quilts. Next slide please. This is another piece I made using this technique and it's called I Look Within to See and it's currently on display in Australia as part of curator Brenda Gale Smith's Vision 2020 exhibit. It's a photograph of my eye taken by my daughter and I did the same playing around with it. This sort of work is very, it's labor intensive, but it's something I'm drawn to. It almost acts as meditation for me and my head got, just goes off into another place when I'm doing this sort of work and I, I love it. Next slide, please. This slide shows four from a collection of nine that I made to the theme Interchange Threads Connect for an exhibition at the South African National Guild along with the South African Guild and Germany. These started off as photographs of traffic interchanges um, and I played around with them and created a series of work. Next slide, please. Just want to show you a quick few slides to finish off of some of my other work as I make a lot of quilts. Nature does creep into my work quite a lot. And um, I enjoy using it as inspiration. I love learning new skills and techniques. There's a thrill in me for it, discovering what techniques I like, and then I will make more work with that. To me, learning is, is an ongoing process and a huge part of my practice. Next slide, please. Journal and sketchbook work often acts as inspiration from my work. And here's a perfect illustration. On the left is one of my journal pages. And in the middle is my first Sakwa journal quilt uh, made to the theme home. And on the right there, you have a detail of it. Next slide, please. I do love to work in series and I'm especially fond of anything that involves mess and getting my hands dirty. So I love dyeing, printing, stenciling, painting, anything like that where I can just lose myself and have some fun. These pieces started off as rubbings and prints taken from very large gunnery leaves. And they're part of one of the first series I made based on life cycles and the seasons. And finally, my last slide, please, Lucy. These are just some pieces for an internet group that I was involved in. And they're based on photographs I took during a trip to Canada. So the photographs are layered and placed over each other. And then I used a photo transfer technique to put them onto fabric and quilted them. I love mixing old skills with modern technology. There's a thrill in it for me. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I would just like to express my gratitude and thanks to SACWA for all the amazing work that they do. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to the next speaker, Kit Vincent, an acclaimed textile artist who creates the most stunning work. And I'm sure you're going to love what she's going to show you. Thanks so much, Paula. Hello, everybody. Lucy, could I have the next slide, please? Today, I plan to talk about my Fast Water series, which relates to my experience living on the St. Lawrence River or Seaway for some 10 years. I'll be uh, focusing on, on this piece in particular, Debacle, it's called, for this talk, as it was accepted into SACWA's Primal Forces exhibit. Debacle is a French word 
you hear a lot in Quebec in early spring. It refers to ice breakup. Next slide, please. So 15 years ago, we built a house on the St. Lawrence River. It was going to be our dream home. And this led to a very watery series for me. And these are just a few examples uh, of some of my preoccupation during that decade. Uh, next slide, please. Sort of like Paula, I've got a bit of geography here to show you. Uh, this shows the St. Lawrence Seaway outlined in green. As you can see, it's a lot more than just a river. It uh, includes the five Great Lakes, uh, that little skinny part in the middle, which is the river itself, the St. Lawrence River, and then shooting down south is the Richelieu and the Hudson River that leads you right into New York um, Harbor. And then further east, out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, right into the Atlantic Ocean. And this, of course, is, is called a seaway because of container ships that float back and forth, carrying goods all the way into the heart of North America. Next slide, please. So this is a view of our home from our upper deck. Absolutely beautiful shot taken early April showing a mostly uh, what we saw during the winter months, which is a smooth white icy cover. But you could see since it's early spring, uh, the uh, seaway has opened up a little bit and that would be the shipping lanes. We were quite lucky to uh, score a patch of land uh, giving way onto the shipping lanes so we could watch these cargo ships with their very colorful uh, cargo floating back and forth. Uh, next slide, please. This is a view from my studio, my gorgeous studio, which was the size of the depth of our house on the lower level of the house and it had three picture windows giving onto the St. Lawrence River. And the next slide shows closer to the water dockside was a little pre-war cabin that was left on this uh, parcel of land. And I opened it up, cleaned it up, dusted it off, got rid of the spiders, and turned it into what I call my little art shack. And uh, I brought all my dyes down there, my fabric paints, and I could make a royal mess. It was not air conditioned, so it could get to be quite warm in, in uh, the midsummer months right about now. And of course, dyes love that warm, humid. Uh, I was able to get beautiful depths of shades in that, uh, in that little cabin. And I had uh, uh, a, a big bank of uh, screened windows. And uh, when I opened those up, it was just me and the seagulls. The next slide shows uh, early work. Um, as you can see, I was preoccupied with current, with uh, river currents and uh, really pleasant things such as sun, sunrises and sunsets. The next slide shows um, some of these container ships, the very colorful container ships that would uh, just float up and down. And uh, the next slide show, uh, also shows a piece that uh, I named Seagate, which was all about the uh, 15 locks uh, that are on the seaway or that were built in the seaway. I think two of them are American, 13 of them are Canadian. And these locks would raise and lower these container ships as they made their way through various passages right past the Great Lakes. So the next slide shows that uh, we, of course, built a dock. And because we built a dock, we bought a boat and uh, we tied that boat to our dock. And the next slide will give you uh, a sense of some of the weather that we ran into. We had not factored the impact of weather on our boat or our dock. And if you recall September 2008, Hurricane Ike uh, that uh, I think decimated the town of Galveston and, and Houston, Texas, landed on our doorstep up in the St. Lawrence. And we heard very loud banging and cranking one night and discovered that our boat and our dock were basically colliding into each other and destroying each other. The next slide will give you a sense of what it was like in April as we experienced this ice breakup or this dead backla. The ice here is pretty well broken up, but in the beginning, uh, we would hear very loud 
groaning sounds and the inevitable banging against our dock causing more damage. So of course, uh, we uh, sold our boat. <laughs> we sold the house, the cabin, the dock, and we came running back to the city where we now very happily live. The next slide shows my new studio uh, that does not have a view, but does have a design wall that goes on forever. And you can see Debacle on this wall, current, under construction in this uh, picture. And the next slide shows a detailed of some of these pin strips ready for the sewing machine. The next slide shows a really colorful catalog that I was delighted to receive, Primal Forces Earth. It arrived recently. It's a fantastic permanent record of this exhibit in that each piece that was accepted into the show gets a two page spread in color. So appreciated. And this uh, footnote slide, the next one, um, is about my beloved dockside cabin. I had dreams of sitting out on our Muskoka chairs in the evening to enjoy evening sunsets, but that was not to be due to regular invasions of shad flies at dusk. So this is an example of more primal forces at work and perhaps a subject of another series for perhaps somebody else. And lastly, I would like to introduce Carol for the third part of this presentation. Okay. And uh, let's see, I think I have to turn my video on and share screen. Um, okay. So this is um, your screen sharing from the beginning. Okay, another, another piece about ice. I'm Carol Feller Gentry, and I live in Port Townsend, Washington, where the far northeast corner of the Olympic Peninsula, where all the big sh ships turn right to go to Seattle. I don't know what that is. Um, this is my studio. Um, at one end, I look out into the forest. Uh, this is the view from my computer. Sometimes we have visitors. At the other end, I look out over Puget Sound. Um, this is the view from my sewing machine. I made my first quilt in 1975 and my first art quilt in 1983. So I've been at this for quite a long time. Uh, <clears throat> I also had a 30 year career traveling all over the world teaching and eventually that took me to 11 countries on five continents. In 1984, I learned how to dye fabric and gradations and a couple years later I started making multicolored fabric by painting with dye. So for 20 years from 84 to 2003 almost all my quilts were made entirely from my own hand dyed and hand painted fabrics. <clears throat> in 2002, I started licensing some of my hand painted designs to Benertex and these quilts were all made entirely from my commercial collections. Naturally, I've also mixed them together and once the quilt is made, it's hard to tell which fabrics are which. After 1999, I also began adding fabrics that I had designed on the computer and printed on an inkjet printer. And almost immediately after bubble jet set was invented in 1999, I started incorporating my travel photography into my quilts. So this one <clears throat> was made entirely from photos that I took in South Africa in 2000. So every diamond there was printed on an inkjet printer. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice, I don't know what happened here. In 2014, I snapped this picture of a busy intersection in Bali and for crosswalk, I printed the figure of the woman on a laser printer. The um, background is uh, pieced from hand-dyed fabric and my Benertex collections. 
First Ladies was one of the first quilts I made with spoon flower fabric. My inspiration was this 1920 photo of officers from the National Women's Party. Shortly before I started this quilt, I bought a new Microsoft Surface Design Studio computer, and I got lots of practice drawing and painting on it while I was making this quilt. <clears throat> it has a 16 by 24 inch touch screen that tilts like a drawing board and I can draw or paint directly on the screen using my finger or a stylus. So it's just like drawing with pencil. That glove is to prevent me making a big paint mess every time my skin touches the screen. So this hexagon quilt has the portraits and names of women who have achieved important firsts in the last hundred years. Names of 162 first ladies are included. If you see a name on the front of the quilt and don't know what that women, woman did, you can lift the quilt within a quilt and see what she accomplished on the panel below. I used a photo I took in Paris in 2009 as inspiration for a quilt called Hanging at the Pompidou, referring to the Pompidou Museum. Um, <clears throat> I designed and painted this whole thing on the computer and had it printed in a single piece. So technically this is a whole cloth quilt and a detail. In 2018, we visited Antelope Canyon and naturally took hundreds of pictures. Who doesn't? And a detail of one of those. In January of last year, we visited the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum near Tucson and took dozens of bird photos. I left a lot of negative space in this one and painted the background so it would look more threatening. I used the pattern on the breast of the hawk to create matching binding strips and hanging sleeves for the back and a detail. In February of 2020, we visited Torres del Paine National Park in southern Chile. I combined elements from two different photos to make guanaco. So this quilt is larger than the maximum fabric width that's available from Spoonflower. So the design was printed in two pieces and applique to form the complete image. Our last stop of 2020, just before everything shut down, was Antarctica. On some days, we floated among giant icebergs in open zodiacs. It was like floating through a museum of giant modern art sculptures. We asked our guides to find us some nice ice, and they did. So this is the first of the photos I chose as inspiration for a quilt. After a lot of editing and painting, this is the digital image I sent to Spoonflower. <clears throat> I wanted the quilt to be 30 by 30, so I made the image 31 by 31 to allow for the shrinkage that happens when it's quilted. And this is the first of my nice ice quilts, and it's also the quilt that is in this exhibition. It's quilted almost to the level of machine embroidery. And the full quilt again. Well, the giant icebergs were spectacular, but sometimes I found the details even more interesting. I did a lot of editing, drawing, and painting on this one. And this was the image I uploaded to Spoonflower. I leave extra space around the edges when I have my images printed so I have something to hang on to while I'm quilting. For all my <clears throat> free motion quilting, I use a stationary head machine that was custom built for me in 1999 and unfortunately you can't buy one. So in this piece I used more than 20 different shades of turquoise, blue and lavender thread. And this quilt is currently touring with Quilt National. I made four more quilts inspired by Antarctica. This is glacier number one, which is also behind me today. 
Remote float is another piece in which I'm playing with negative space and a detail. <clears throat> These are remnants of a Norwegian whaling operation from the early 1900s, and I think the Norwegians ought to come and clean this up. But once again, my inspiration was found in the details. Uh, this is a bit of rust scale, and it became the inspiration for two quilts. This is deception decomposition number one, um, the first of that series, and a detail. And deception decomposition number two. In this one, I saturated all the colors, then made a mirror image and reversed the colors to their complements. And with a little more repeating and mirror imaging, I came up with this design. And I think that's all the time I have right now, but you can find every quilt I've ever made on my website, along with larger images and details about how they were made. And you can also find a lot of free patterns, free instructions and free tutorials. So thank you very much. And I think it's time to go back to Martha. Thank you, Carol. Um, when you are exited out of sharing your screen. Okay, good. Um, no, you're still, sh well, no, Lucy, that's me, isn't it? All right, here we go. Hey, all right, Paula and Kit, if you could turn your video and your mics back on. All right, here we are. Okay, that was amazing. Oh my goodness. I really feel like I've just been on a, a whirlwind world tour um, of all of these wonderful places around the world that have inspired each of you and your art. And um, you can see why you are three of the artists who chose to apply to Primal Forces Earth because that's a lot of what in inspires your work. Um, I'm going to start with Paula, and um, everybody wanted to know, Paula, if you would again talk about the app that you used to translate the photos into those mosaic designs for, for that series of quilts. I use a computer program called Photoshop. Oh, okay. Photoshop is the one everybody's familiar with. Um, and then when you're quilting them, are you quilting every single black line in that mosaic? Yep. Okay. I have one in my machine at the moment. Your, your, your sound just Can you hear me, Mike? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so Lucy just Better. turned your video off. Say that again. Uh, I have one in my machine at the moment that's 30 inches long and it takes me 10 minutes to do one little row. Oh. That's about, <laughs> um, it's about half a centimeter wide the row. So it's, it's very slow. So mm -hmm. that's where the getting lost in it comes, comes in. Yeah. Well, and, and that is something that I heard from a lot of art quilters during the pandemic was that quilting was a really wonderful way to just enter into a state of sort of meditation and escape from all the stress of world events. Um, Kit, um, the question, the technical question for you um, is, uh, we saw that great photo of your studio with all those different bins of the strips of fabric that you use. And um, the question is, how do you go from all of those bins into your final composition? Uh, those bins, in fact, uh, those were, you should see my new bins. Hang on, let me just, I'm going to go get one for you. Here's one. This is my um, one of, uh, this is, so this is an example of three bins. These are these little uh, shelving things that people buy for the refrigerators and they, they stack their Coke cans in here mm -hmm. and they, they come with dividers. So I've got two of these for each color and they are my crayon box. So I've got six shades of this particular cool 
red violet and I've got six shades of all 12 colors of the wheel and mm -hmm. a couple of extra bins for some neutrals and um, and blacks and grays. And and when you are putting them up on your design wall, do you have a plan or is it completely intuitive placement? Well, um, I work uh, sort of uh, I I sort of make a quilt backwards. I start with an under layer, which is usually pieced, sometimes applique, but mostly pieced. So this is, these are geometric shapes. And they would, um, for me, represent sort of an architecture, a basic architecture that I would use. And then these strips, um, I will start, I, I will use that under layer as a sort of a general guideline Mm -hmm. And I'll start with the darkest, whitest strips. And I'll just start with one and I'll lay it. So it's like a big, a big pencil mark going right across that way. I'll start with that. And if I like it, it stays there. I put two pins, one at the beginning, one at the end. And then I'll go back and get another strip and put it next to it and on onwards and so forth. So I have a sort of a general idea of what I want because I've got the outer dimensions of my piece. But the um, the the uh, uh, surface construction is improvisational. Okay. And uh, one quick follow up: Do you there are several layers of progressively smaller strips? Do you do one section with all of its layers, or do you do all of the big strips and then go back and do smaller and smaller? I've done both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's a good answer. Both yeah. ways work. Oh yeah, they both work. Carol, um, the questions have to do with your uh, photo transfer process. So obviously you're taking gorgeous photos to start with, but could you talk in a little more detail about what you're doing on your computer um, with the drawing tools and, and then you know how do you know when you've got what you want to be printed? Sure. Um, well, I use Corel Draw because that's what I started with in uh, 1990 when I bought my first computer. Uh, it's a competitive product to Adobe. And I, um, well, gosh, you know, all the ways that you can edit photographs, I just play around with them. And then what I've learned is that there's a lot of elements in photographs that you often don't really enjoy quilting. And so, <laughs> so um, what I do is actually, especially in my ice pieces, once I had them in a square format, I just treated them like graphic designs. In the second one, I repeated some elements and painted out the things I didn't want to quilt around. And sometimes, I mean, some of the things I'm doing, I paint the whole surface by the time it's done. And in others, um, the photograph itself um, doesn't need a lot extra. So I'm just turning that into a bitmap and uploading it to Spoonflower. And one of the things you may have noticed is I started in some of my quilts actually designing matching binding strips. So if I have a little extra room on the side, <laughs> I just design binding strips to match. Mm -hmm. And what kind of fabric are you asking spoon flour, spoon flour to print on? <laughs> um, I use the petal, comp, petal cotton, which is their default cotton. And it's, um, they have some more finely woven fabrics that are more like Bali batiks, but I don't like Bali batiks for the same reason I don't like them. It's hard to needle through. I like mm. to be able to put a needle through them easily and the petal cotton is just a nice quilting weight. And so I'm kind of sticking with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those high thread counts are great for sheets, but not so great for stitching. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Paula, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, we saw towards the end, some of the other series that you work in, and you talked a little bit about how one of the things that you really enjoy is the combination of ancient techniques in quilting with modern technology. Do you stay in one series for a while or do you jump around? Um, 
both. <laughs> I have a current series that I'm working on, but every now and then I'll go back to an old piece um, or an old series and maybe play around with something there. I, I often um, rework pieces or cut them up and use them into something new, you know, turn them into something new. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so a bit of both, Martha. <laughs> I don't know if it helps. <laughs> uh huh. And um, like Carol, you seem to take a lot of photographs and use them as inspiration. Do, does what you photograph change depending on the series that you're working on? Or are you just photographing whatever is around you that's catching your eye? I, I think, you know, the modern phones are just amazing because I don't have to carry around a big clunky camera with me now. Uh, I don't think I've used my digital camera since I got a decent, you know, phone. Mm -hmm. So I photograph every day. I have, I think, about 40,000 photos on my, um, on my Mac. So, uh -huh. Yeah, um, we keep running out of space. Yeah, yeah, I just photograph all the time bits and pieces that I see that that details it's details this this morning I was photographing you know the waves and the water the ripples on the water and mm -hmm. a plant I came across I hadn't seen before it was like oh that's pretty um I need a photo of that mm -hmm. um, and, and I just I just want to say how in awe I am of you for going swimming when it's snowing oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone had said it to me this time last year, I'd be doing this. I'd have laughed at them and told them to be, not to be so silly. <laughs> but, you know, I think this pandemic has, has changed a lot of us in, in strange and wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Kit, I wanted to ask you, you showed some earlier work, which is um, similar to the work that I remember you doing a long time ago now, um, where things are pieced, but they are carefully pieced together. So there are no raw threads, no raw edges. And your, your recent work for quite a while now has had all raw edges that are just unraveling a little bit. Threads are not carefully finished. Can you talk a little bit about why the change and what I, th I see it as adding a lot of energy to your work? Um, but I want, wondered if you would talk a little bit about why you made that switch and what, you know, why you like it. Yeah, it, um, it, it happened quite suddenly in 2013. Um, I was, uh, I, I studied under Nancy Crow in the uh, first decade of, of, uh, of that, well, from 2000 to 2010. And uh, um, I learned to piece. I, I, I had very little quilting uh, experience prior to that. Uh, I knew how to sew clothes. That was about it. And so what I learned was piecing. I, I learned the art of piecing. And mm -hmm. I found myself progressively more and more uh, sewing and uh, I should say quilting these pieced uh, chunks of design uh, to within an inch of their life. I was like back and forth, back and forth. And uh, I, I have to tell you, honestly, had it not been for audiobooks, I probably would have gone completely insane. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, and then one day um, I, I, I had a piece of design on my wall and I turned it back to front and I thought, you know, gee, that looks really good. And then I, and, and because of all the raw edges on it, and I thought, what if I put another raw edge next to that raw edge, et cetera, et cetera. And then something else happened that summer in 2013. Um, there was a, a, a well, you know, I, I, I work like most of us in a, a solitary studio and I have talk radio come in uh, on, uh, on a regular basis. And uh, there was this um, crash that occurred uh, in Quebec. Uh, it was a, an out of, uh, what is it, a runaway train uh, that crashed into a small town and blew up. It was called Megantic. The town was called Megantic. It was on a lake. It was a little tourist area in Quebec. And uh, we have friends whose children live there. So that stopped me dead in my tracks. Uh, uh, close to 50 people died in that. They were basically incinerated. It was a train carrying oil. 
-hmm. And um, uh, I think th that summer was the summer that I started laying these little fragile uh, raw edge strips uh, on a, a gridded surface. It seemed sort of appropriate at the time. And um, it's been uh, sort of my preferred way of working since. I'm, I'm not done with it. Mm -hmm. it, it. It creates a really interesting surface. And I'm so glad to hear what the backstory was. That um, is really powerful. Carol, um, I wanted to ask you to clarify, because somebody asked, um, when you're saying that you're painting in the background, you're talking about using a tool in the Corel Draw thing, not with a paintbrush, is that correct? That's right. Well, I'm using this. This is a stylus that I use on my touch screen, but I can use any of the paints and blends and, and tools that are available in Corel Photo Paint. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that answers that question. Um, and then I wanted to ask you, because um, the vast body of your work up until fairly recently was mostly um, pieced and applique from your own hand-dyed fabrics, and your recent work is mostly based on photographs that are being transferred. Um, can you talk about that shift and um, do you miss doing all of the, the piecing and applique work? Well, uh, yes and no. I, you know, I, I, along with my piece work, I've been incorporating photos into my work since like 2000. So right. it's not a new thing. And in a lot of ways, I'm just creating new fabric and having it produced in a new way. And I did, I, I hadn't made, a piece quilt since 2019 and this spring I was kind of missing the piecing process. So I designed a quilt and made the big drawing on freezer paper, but I actually on, on my computer designed an individual light to dark fabric for each and every little plume in the quilt. And so it was a piece quilt, but I um, I combined digital fabric that I designed specifically for that piece with some of my commercial fabric and my hand dyes. So I'm mixing it all up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's wonderful. The, the um, piece that you showed of the woman in the crosswalk right. um, was definitely, you know, it's the woman from the photo, but then the whole background has been changed. Exactly. Um, would you say that this gives you even greater control and that's something that you enjoy about the creative process? Yes, it, it's, I, it, it allows me to express my OCD. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, when I was hand dyeing and painting fabrics, I was fantasizing about being able to just create whatever I wanted and have as much of it as I wanted. And the fantasy has come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and somebody commented, um, Nancy Crow versus David Walker, order versus chaos. And um, I think that was in response to Kit describing how her work had moved from being very structured to now being much more looser and improvisational. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody wanted to say, um, Carol, did you ever get any negative feedback about using photographs that are printed rather than the more traditional applique and piecing that the community tends to expect? Um, actually, less, less than I expected. Okay. Um, far less then a far less negative feedback than we got when my quilt won best of show in 1989 and it was machine quilted. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm an artist and as technology has changed, the tools that we can use to create the images that are in our heads have changed. And I don't really give people any extra credit for making it the hardest way they can think of. <laughs> 
Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I have, um, I have had a few comments on my Facebook page that people who think this is cheating, well, you know, same thing when we started using sewing machines. Right. Yeah. Right. I, and, you know, yeah. And, and Paula, you obviously agree with Carol on that because you're also using a lot of photo transfer techniques in your work. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I make a lot of collage as well. And you know, I agree with her totally that you don't have to make it the hardest way possible, you know, and, you know, we are art quilters and, you know, we have to push what we do and learn and develop and this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to thank all three of you for joining us today. Um, your work is really inspirational. There have been all these comments about how beautiful the work is and how thrilled people are to have heard about your process to see how the earth inspires you in making your art. Um, I loved especially seeing Kit's work next to the photo of the ice float because it really showed how that natural event affected her work. And because Kit's work is very abstract, it was fun to see how, yes, it's abstract, but it, there's a basis there that is of a photograph and that was wonderful. Um, everybody, we are, I wanna um, again, thank our sponsors and then we will be showing a slideshow of the entire exhibition. Um, so you can see how Paula's, Kit's and Carol's work fits into the full uh, Primal Forces Earth exhibition. So I hope you'll hang in there to see the whole exhibition, please go to SAQA's website, saqa.com. The exhibition is posted there and you can buy a copy of the catalog, which Kit was showing in her presentation so that you can have your own copy of all these beautiful artworks. So again, I would like to thank our sponsors. Without them, we could not produce textile talks. I would like to thank Moda, Quilting Daily, E Quilter, Orophil Threads, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Exotic Silks, Tie Silks, and TheQuiltShow.com. Please thank them. Without them, this would not be possible. And here's the full exhibition please sit back and enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.